left right. Um, hello, I'm also going to be talking about um, using Bayes analysis for construction chronologies for settlement, but um, not in an island context, in an upland context. Um, so this is discussing my PhD research, which is ongoing at the moment. Um, I'm looking at constructing new chronologies for a second millennium BC upland land use. Um, so basically uh, creating new, more precise chronologies for um, upland settlement in the second millennium BC or more broadly the Bronze Age. Um, basically it's well tested to in the literature that you do have an expansion into or an intensification of upland settlement um, during the Bronze Age. Um, basically it's uh, why. Um, there's been economic and social causes posited, um, paleo, uh, environmental causes have been floated as well. Um, but it's basically the thing is, is that the chronologies aren't really precise enough to make correlations between different types of evidence, so between, say, the paleo environmental record and between our archaeological record, um, but also about how people are using these places, whether, um, whether the houses, uh, sorry, the round houses are occupied um, contemporaneously or whether um, they're kind of occupied for short periods, whether there's a dura long duration of settlement at these sites. Um, so basically, more precise chronologies will help us to achieve um, basically more nuanced and hopefully more precise interpretations. Um, so the key case study that I'm using to explore this, again, this is a piece of primarily archival research. Um, so I'm conscious that there are maybe a couple of you in here who've worked on this project, uh, but it's the Lairg project. Um, so Lairg up in Sutherland, um, excavated late 1980s into the 1990s. It's a really significant site in the literature, as you probably know, um, and really um, informative for how we understand Scottish um, upland settlement during this period. Um, so basically this is a project that looked at exploring um, the relationship between um, land use and settlement over time. Really well dated project, I think at the time the best dated uh, Scottish site, although somebody can tell me if I'm wrong. Um, so you've got 139 radiocarbon dates from there. However, only seven of these are AMS dates. Um, so AMS dates are on single entity samples, uh, which is now best practice. Uh, but at the time, it was normal to use um, mixed samples. Um, obviously at Laird, um, I know there wasn't a lot of oak anyway, but uh, and that it was also there was um, efforts were made to include short-lived species, so things like alder, things like um, hazel. But there's still the possibility that you have differently aged wood within those mixed samples, uh, which is then perhaps affecting the dates that you're getting out of those. Uh, so now, obviously, AMS dating is the norm. We can date really small samples. Um, so a strand of this project is basically to provide a check on those legacy dates and to check, essentially, whether these dates um, and dates from sites similar to Lairg, excavated at a similar time, are things that we can trust. Um, so, uh, basically, I know Kat's been through Bayesian analysis. Um, it's this idea of using prior archaeological information to inform um, our radiocarbon date distributions. Um, in this instance, I'm primarily going to be looking at stratigraphy, but you can use um, other, other prior information. Um, that's not the only option. So, to start with, the first strand is this idea of performing almost like a check on these legacy dates. So what I did was I've taken a selection of dates from uh, published dates from the monograph, uh, basically identified dates, contexts that I thought would have secure taphonomy, um, and made some preliminary models. Um, so what you can see here is that there are slight shifts, uh, particularly for House 4, which um, it was originally interpreted was um, in use potentially up until around uh, 1000 BC. Uh, what I was seeing uh, was potentially a shift there um, to this kind of um, mid-second millennium date um, rather than being used right up until um, the end of the millennium. Um, again, these models here, you can see house two, house three. You've got these uh, concentrations around that earlier to mid-second millennium BC. House six there is a different type of site and that's actually something that's potentially interesting. So if these patterns are... Uh, born out. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to redate all of these samples. Um, so I'm just waiting on some results back from that at the moment, um, and then see whether essentially the results that I'm getting match the legacy dates. Um, and if that is the case, um, then that's potentially interesting in the fact that we could have a shift in the chronology for this site. Um, which so house six there uh, was thought to have had a non-domestic function. Um, so if we are seeing settlement cessation. Uh, a cessation of activity at these um, settlement sites um, in the latter part of the second millennium BC um, and a shift to kind of, um, I think the, uh, the hypothesis was that house six was used for keeping livestock, then that's potentially an interesting um, 
an interesting aspect for discussion. Um, however, if it's not borne out, then that potentially indicates that we have issues with using legacy dates and that we should be cautious of these types of dates in the future. Uh, the second strand, obviously this would be a really small sample size on which to build uh, precise and um, kind of more complex chrono chronological models. Uh, so the second part of this is assessing the archive, identifying new samples to date from the archive, and then making more complex chronological models with them. So in practice, this has involved a lot of archival work. Um, I've been moving about a lot between um, the archives in John Sinclair House, which is where the paper archive is uh, for this project, and also the physical archive up in Inverness. Um, so I've been through the whole paper archive uh, to check exactly what was where. It took forever. Um, so it's in, yeah, these boxes numbered 1 to 106. I don't think it's actually 106 boxes. I think it's probably like 80 something, um, but still plenty. Um, check what's where, check where the records that are actually going to be useful to me are, um, because there's all sorts in there. There's like receipts brochures for holiday homes, um, <laughs> catalogue the physical archive as well, so that's kept up in Inverness Museum, uh, they've been really generous in allowing me access to their uh, collection there, uh, that was, uh, yeah, 1,416 1, bags of charcoal I think I catalogued there, um, and then basically matching these two records, so going through the catalogue I've made of the charcoal samples, and then matching it to the context records um, to find out exactly where that charcoal has come from um, and there are uh, notes made of the stratigraphic relationships as well on those records from which I can then start to build uh, my Bayesian models. Um, and also, yes, yeah, so this is to identify context of interest as well, uh, which is primarily based on whether the charcoal in them is likely to have, uh, whether the following is likely to be secure. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so the two Sites that, uh, sorry, the sites I'm focusing on for now um, are excavated sites with complex stratigraphy. Uh, so there's six excavated um, sites with uh, settlement sites with second, <coughs> sorry, sites with second, round houses or hut circle sites with second millennium VC dates um, from Laird. Um, so I'm looking at the house one, house four sites and uh, the house two, three, six. Um, I'm coming to house four at five later because honestly I just couldn't spend that much more time looking at charcoal, it was draining. Um, <laughs> so basically house one, house four, uh, you, both of these sites you have um, kind of pre-roundhouse activity, so you have um, kind of pits and things in the subsoils uh, thought to represent potentially Neolithic activity. Um, house one, house four, you have um, an early uh, second millennium BC roundhouse that's then succeeded by a much larger one. Uh, house four is that one for which potentially the chronology is shifting slightly, uh, although we will see if that is borne out. Um, houses 2, 3 and 6, again, uh, this is a kind of pretend section I made up for uh, house 2 and 6, uh, but again you've got this um, successive phases of use and, um, and cultivated soils there, um, and so eventually you've got peat formation at the site. Um, so these are the sites that I've been exploring for now, uh, I'll come back to house 5, and um, I'd quite like to look at the, um, the dikes as well, the, uh, the agricultural remains. Uh, because it's obviously it's important to know um, the relationship between the two types of site. So the key considerations with sample selection there are uh, representing the main phases of site use. Um, so I'm obviously relying on the excavation archive for that because it's not like I can go back and redig them and come up with my own interpretations. Um, but basically, yeah, taking the phasing into account uh, and taphonomy is really the key thing here. So it's whether we can um, establish a really clear relationship between an activity and the charcoal that's in the context. Um, so at the moment I'm prioritising um, samples from hearths, uh, internal postals and also internal pits and gullies. Um, and also the wood type's important, obviously uh, you don't want to be getting something really long lived in there because that's going to skew your dates. Uh, so I'm prioritising things like hazel, things like alder. Um, the number of samples uh, we're looking at through simulations, um, so basically um, there are about 130 uh, samples that could potentially be of interest uh, from those sites I just outlined there. Um, we might not need all of those to achieve um, to achieve a good chronological resolution. So really the, the key advantage, and I'm sorry I should have stressed this earlier, with Bayesian analysis is that uh, rather than looking at chronological resolutions uh, in kind of the order of centuries, you can move down to decades, you can move down to looking at change at a generational level. Um, but obviously there's a trade-off between the number of dates 
and between the number of samples that you need to, uh, number of dates you need to include in your models um, and the chronological resolution uh, that's achievable. Um, so basically what I've been doing is basically producing simulated models to um, establish whether uh, what number of samples is needed to achieve a desirable uh, level of chronological resolution. At the moment, I think we can get it down to about a century. It'd be nice to get a sub-century resolution on that, um, ultimately, because then you're looking at how, potentially, how generations are using these sites, um, which would be really, really interesting to look at change in the human lifetime. So there are a few next steps for the project. Um, understanding the landscape context, that was something that's obviously key um, to the original project. Um, so next week, Monday, yeah, Monday next week, uh, heading up to Larry, going to take some cores uh, from two of the sites that were uh, created as part of the original project. Um, so I think it's AG two and three from memory. Uh, so up at Alock and, and down at the settlement site. Um, so basically, you can see this age depth model here. Uh, the period that I'm interested in doesn't necessarily have. Um, a lot of dates there uh, to be working with, so we would like to get a better dated paleo-environmental record that we can then correlate with that settlement record um, and really see how these people are using that landscape and how, um, how that's related to the settlement there. Um, so they're going over to University College Cork uh, in the summer, as am I, and um, we'll be analysing them there. Um, so I'm also in the process of, uh, I've got some samples waiting on the AMS just now. Uh, so waiting on results from those, uh, modeling them, um, and then just carrying on with uh, selecting samples, running up to Inverness, bringing them back down to East Kilbride, um, analyzing them, and then modeling these dates. Um, so, so obviously this is very much a work in progress. Um, so any comments, any questions would be really welcome. I know there's a panel afterwards, but um, if you do want to find out more about the project, um, I'm on Twitter. Um, and we're both blogging about this as well, actually, at uh, Bays and Bones. Um, so that's worth checking out if you are interested in this kind of thing. Um, but thank you very much. <laughs>